Welcome to VNTV, I'm Alexander Nguyen. Today we are joined by a special guest, retired Rear Admiral Larry Chambers. He was the first African American to command a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier, and also the first African American to be named Rear Admiral. But what most Vietnamese people remembered him for was the controversial order during Operation Frequent Win to push millions of dollars worth of helicopters overboard so Republic of Vietnam Air Force Major Buon Le could land his Cessna bird dog on the carrier, thereby saving the lives of the Major, his wife, and their five children. Well, welcome to the show. I know you are here today uh, for uh, live the operation, live the adventure Operation Frequent Wind on July 11th. So let's talk about Operation Frequent Wind. What is it for those who are not familiar? Operation Frequent Wind was a code name given to the potential evacuation of Saigon in the event the North Vietnamese started to come south. And as it turns out, uh, we assembled uh, 25 uh, ships uh, mm -hmm. off of Vung Tau in preparation for a possible evacuation as the North tanks, North Vietnamese tanks were rolling closer to Saigon. And so we were in the process of evacuating uh, the U.S. citizens who were working there and evacuating the, the Vietnamese who were working very closely uh, with the U.S. Uh, in country. Okay. And uh, you were just given command of the uh, USS Midway about, what, three months before the operation? No, no, no. I was in command of the USS Midway exactly 29 days <laughs> when we started uh, the operation. So you were given the order from, uh, to sail from Subic Bay to uh, Saigon, or um, we what were, were your orders? We were given orders to proceed to the southern tip of Vietnam. In the process, we offloaded all of the fixed-wing aircraft off of the flight deck. So mm -hmm. the flight deck was totally free of fixed-wing aircraft, and we were told to rendezvous with two Air Force helicopter squadrons known as the Jolly Green Rescue uh, H-53s, and we rendezvoused with those uh, uh, two squadrons off the southern tip of Vietnam, and then from there we were ordered to proceed to uh, a position just uh, uh, east of Vung Tau. We were about 100 miles, 100 nautical miles off of Vung Tau. Yeah. And were you giving any specific orders? We, we were ordered to go there and we were ordered to stand by and make preparations for. And we anticipated that there was going to be an operation. We practiced emergency drills, everything that we could think of. Uh, could possibly happen to be ready in case the evacuation order was given. Yeah. And I heard that you were, when you were given the order to go to Phum Tau, you were given about, what, three days to get ready? Uh, well, we, we were in Subic, mm -hmm. and we were scheduled for 10 days, 10 day import period, and we were doing maintenance on the ship uh, with the uh, Subic Bay maintenance facility, and three days into that maintenance facility, we were ordered to get underway, make best speed, uh, and to proceed off of uh, the southern tip, pick up the two Air, Air Force squadrons, and then proceed off of Vung Tau and be ready in case the order was given to evacuate. And like between that, how many days was that? Well, we, we were, on the 23rd of April, we were in position off of the southern tip of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of Vietnam, and we proceeded from, from there to off of Vang Tau, and we were off of Vang Tau oh, by the 24th, 25th, and the execute, uh, the order to start the evacuation occurred on the, the uh, 28th of uh, of April. So that's pretty much the time frame. Okay. But uh, you didn't really know the operation had started until Wing Kao Ki's uh, airplane w um, helicopter when, landed. When, when, when the Vice Premier, formerly uh, head of the South Vietnamese Air Force, landed, that was about noon on the 28th, I believe it was. He landed about noon, and that was the first sign that we had that the evacuation may commence. And as soon as he landed, uh, we informed uh, 
the uh, Blue Ridge, which, is, which was in charge of the whole operation, that uh, General Key had landed, and they immediately told us to transfer him over to the flagship. So Key was on board maybe 10, 15 minutes before he was put in another helicopter and flown uh, over to Blue Ridge. And per the admiral's orders, and, and from that, there on, just helicopters coming in. Uh, well, about three o'clock that afternoon, fifteen hundred nautical time, mm -hmm. uh, we were received the order to execute free, frequent wind. We had ten very large helicopters on board, and they were launched to go into the Saigon area at designated rescue points to start uh, bringing evacuees out, mm -hmm. and most of the evacuees. Uh, the, the, the big helicopters landed uh, on the grounds of the U.S. Embassy, and, and that picked up a large number. There were several designated spots around Saigon that were designated for pickup, and that's where the big hel helicopters were going. In addition to those helicopters, the Vietnamese Army had uh, Huey's uh, helicopters. Uh, which are designed to hold 10 combat marines or 10 combat infantry guys. Uh, they flew uh, uh, Hueys. The U.S. Army was there, and they flew Hueys. Uh, the CIA was there, and they were doing clandestine things. They flew Hueys, and so, and plus, the Vietnamese uh, uh, Air Force also flew Hueys. So all of these folks got involved in the evacuation. It wasn't just the 10 big helicopters, but I don't know how many helicopters. The number was huge, and they were all bringing uh, refugees out to the 24, actually 25, including the flagship, 25 ships. The, the helicopters were coming. Now, the big uh, H-53s were only landing on, uh, on Midway's flight deck. And the other helicopters were landing on any flight deck that they could find. And all of those helicopters went back and forth uh, from the ships in, out, at, out of Phabung Tower back to the beach. And, and by the time they were running out of fuel, mm -hmm. uh, they always ran out of fuel on, on one of the decks. Uh, we had a huge number of Hueys to, to run out of fuel on Midway's flight deck. and we. We distribute them as best we could and still be able to operate uh, the 10 big helicopters bringing folks. All in all, I believe Midway uh, handles somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 refugees. And of course, the other ships and company were doing the same thing. Now, as these helicopters were landing, the, uh, the major who flew the Cessna he flew by and, you know, circled around several times before you get... Well, it was a... It, it, it was on the 29th, mm -hmm. and the, the, we had about 15 knots of wind, uh, natural wind. Uh, there was a, a light rain uh, in the area, very light, and the Major's airplane came out, and we spotted him uh, through the glasses, through our field glasses, and, and, and he circled a couple of times, and, and when he was circling, I knew it. Uh, my first answer was, why me, Lord? <laughs> why my ship? But there he was, and this is something we're going to have to do. Uh, he, he, he dropped three or four notes, and they went over the side. Uh, they believe the fourth note he dropped may have been wrapped around his, his fist pistol. It was unarmed. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and that hit the crash truck and stayed on deck. They rushed the note up to the bridge, and the note basically said, uh, can you uh, move those uh, airplanes off, those helicopters off of your uh, landing area? Uh, I, can, I can fly one hour more and you have time to rescue me and I'm assigned uh, Major Bong, wife and five, and five child. That was a quote from the, from the note. And I mean, uh, you say uh, that you actually didn't need to read the note. You already knew what I, it said. I, it was obvious. Any aviator knew that. And we tried calling him on, there are two international distress frequencies, one UHF and one VHF. Mm -hmm. We tried calling him on the distress frequencies. And we 
had uh, a Vietnamese go to our control tower who spoke very good English to try to talk to him just in case in, in the excitement he, he reverted to his native native language and it, after many tries we realized that we didn't have uh, radio communications with him but that's no big deal uh, aviators are used to, to the Aldous lamp red light says can't land, green light says, deck's clear, come on aboard. Okay. And so the Admiral was telling me to tell the pilot to ditch. Well, we didn't have any communications. And, and so there wasn't any way to tell him no, except I could, could have put the red uh, Aldous lamp on him and, and to say that the deck is, is not clear and you're not clear to land. My great worry was uh, when he said he had one hour of fuel, he didn't have enough fuel to make it back to dry land. And so the obvious thing is either I'm going to give him a chance to land or he's going to crash it on board. And if he crashes it on board with all of the helicopters and people and things, it was going to be a disaster. And I figured the less, lesser of the evils <laughs> was to make preparations to let Major Lee land. And when I called the air officer on the midway and suggested to him that we need to make a ready deck, uh, he kind of indicated that maybe I had lost my mind <laughs> and uh, anybody could see that the deck was totally clobbered. And I told him I'd give him some help. I got on the ship's general announcing system and asked, actually it was an order, but I asked all uh, air department and air wing personnel that are used to working on the flight deck to report to the flight deck to give the uh, air boss a hand in clearing uh, the deck. In preparation for the operation, our engineers had made a couple of sets of wheels that you could r rock a Huey back on, towards his tail. You could slip these wheels under him, under the skids, and then we could maneuver the airplanes around on deck. And that way it was easy to maneuver the Hueys. To, and so uh, approximately 2,000 people showed up on the flight deck to assist the Air Boss in making a ready deck. And they began pushing the uh, helicopters that were in the foul, over the foul line, which, it, which he needed to get clear. Uh, we started pushing them over the side. And I didn't count them because I knew uh, since I was ordered not to do this, that <laughs> I, I was going to have to face a court-martial. And so I wanted to be able to say uh, when I was in front of the judge that I don't know how many aircraft or how many helicopters we pushed over the side, and which would be the truth. I could take a lie detector test, <laughs> and, and that, would, that would have been the truth. But uh, we pushed quite a few helicopters over the side. And, and luckily, none of them, not a lot of them were Navy, so you're uh, clear. Not a one of them was a Navy <laughs> helicopter. They, as I said, Air America, the Army, the Vietnamese uh, Air Force, uh, the U.S. Air Force, it was all of their helicopters. Uh, and, and, and none of those were sea-based. <laughs> so anything that was sea-based, uh, I didn't have any trouble trying to make a spot over the foul line for them. Okay. But we, we managed to push uh, a number over, and I still don't know what the count is, but I do know that as we turned into the wind, to, in preparation to giving uh, Major, uh, the Major Pong a uh, green light, uh, eight more helicopters landed. They were out of gas. They didn't have any fuel. We couldn't launch them back again. And they landed without signal right in the middle of the area that <laughs> we just cleared. And so the Air Boss called and said, what do we do now? And I said, boy, we are in trouble. We might as well push those eight over the side <laughs> too. And so Vern and his crew went back to work and pushed those over the side and we turned into the wind. I had a high wind over the deck because I wanted to be sure that the Major could stop on the flight deck before he ran out of, uh, ran out of runway. He didn't have a tail hook, obviously, and because he didn't have a tail hook, I stripped the arresting gear uh, off of the flight deck so that, that if he landed in the arresting gear with his little bitty wheels, uh, it, it might cause him to, to, uh, to, to nose up. And anyway, we cleared the area, got the area clear, and gave him a green light, and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. and the Major landed aboard. Uh, it was a beautiful landing. 
uh, I was worried, but turns out he had about 10,000 hours in the airplane, probably an extremely experienced pilot, and I didn't have to worry, but I didn't know that at the time. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, Major Pong brought to, to, to the bridge. We were in chaos with all of the things going on, and I had a few minutes to talk to him, and I took off my uh, Navy wings, and I pinned them on, on Major, uh, Major Bong, and I made him an honorary naval aviator <laughs> right on the spot. That's good. And you found out later that his wife didn't, learn, didn't know how to swim. Well, later on, uh, Major uh, Bong and I were honored at uh, Lakeland uh, Sun and Fun Air Show. Mm -hmm for feats in aviation, that was in, uh, in, in, in 14, 2014. And we both received uh, uh, models uh, of the airplane uh, that had landed, museum quality models, and congratulations. And it was there when he, that he had his whole family and all the grandkids, and there was a lot of hugging and crying going on with, with the reunion. It was there that we, we discovered that Major Lee's wife couldn't swim. And in that sense, if we had told him to ditch, he wasn't going to do it. He was going to land on board or crash on board one, one way or the other. And, and a few years later in Pensacola where the airplane is on display it's a, at the Naval Aviation Museum, Major Lee was in, and his wife were invited for the dedication of, 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 of the uh, airplane hanging in the ceiling. And my wife and I were invited, and it turns out we, I was way in the back of the airplane. He was way up front of the airplane. I didn't see him come aboard. He didn't see me come aboard. But when he was getting off the airplane, as we were in back, I was pointing out to my wife, there goes Major Lee. There he is. Bravest guy I ever said. Hey, guys, I, this guy's crazy. You know, nobody in his right mind would come out <laughs> to an aircraft carrier and try to land without a tail hook. But I said, there he is. Yeah. And, and I'm sure as we exited, his wife turned around and Major Lee said, oh, there I was. She, Mrs. Lee runs back, grabs my wife and says, I was the bravest man <laughs> she ever knew because I pushed all of that stuff over the side. So. We were complimenting each other on being brave. I think we were both idiots at the time, <laughs> but you know, you do what you have to do, and sometimes you get lucky and it turns out fine. Yeah, and when you were named distinguished alumni at West Point, oh, I no, no, it's in Annapolis. Annapolis, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, Major Lee's uh, son wrote you a wrote beautiful letter. A right? beautiful letter, letter in support of my nomination, and it, uh, the, the son. Is a lawyer, a very good lawyer, and he writes beautifully because on the strength of his and a couple of other letters, I was awarded a Distinguished Graduate Award mm -hmm. from the uh, Naval Academy Association, uh, yeah. Alumni Association. And you found out that he was the baby in the... In the uh, he was the, the, the gentleman that wrote the note was the babe in arms of his mom as they landed aboard. Uh, I mean, you know, it's really touching. It really is. And it's just one of those things. I just wish uh, the major could have made it uh, to the award ceremony. He had an invitation, by the way, yeah. uh, to the award ceremony in Annapolis. And uh, let me see, uh, when you were at the 40th anniversary of you know, Operation Frequent Wind here in San Diego, um, there was an incident in which a young lady came up running up to you and hugging you. Uh, yes, I was, and I was there with my wife and family, and this gorgeous creature comes up and grabs me and puts <laughs> her arm around me, and I'm saying, I don't know, I don't know, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> and finally she turned to me and she said, uh, she was, what, I think she was five or six years old uh, when she uh, was landed aboard uh, midway in the, doing the evacuation, and that the crew was very kind to her, and they medically, they gave them food, they examined them medically, and then I think they had to stay overnight, and the crew was giving her M&Ms, and she says to date, this is a commercial for M&Ms, because <laughs> M&Ms are her favorite candy. Yeah. 
And you know, around the 3,000 or so refugees that you rescued, have you kept in touch with any of them besides Major Lee? Uh, no, mostly Major Lee and his family we have kept in touch with. And uh, Major Lee was over to visit us not too long ago, and he brought two of those wonderful tickets to <laughs> Disney World that was good for everything. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what, what those things cost, but it's got to be a mint. And it was, yeah. it was a beautiful gift. And because he works at Disney World. He yeah. works at Disney World and, and has worked there for quite a long time. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here with us today. And I know that you have an event at uh, U.S. at Midway on July 11th from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. And of course, you'll be here again on the 45th anniversary next year, Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. I expect to be here for the 45th. All right. Thanks. Well, well, thank you, uh, Ray Admiral, for being here. Thank you, sir. And well, thank you for joining us here at VNTV.